Well, eschatology. How do you transition from uh, family business to eschatology? And the answer is actually pretty easily. Uh, this is a wonderful doctrine of the church, and it's a doctrine that contextualizes all of life here and now. It's the same way that we tend to judge a story by how it resolves, because that's what it, that tells us what the story meant. Uh, we can look at life and understand its highs and its lows by how history resolves and how we are resolved in that. And so I hope this morning will be an encouragement to us as a church body. Obviously, our, our dear friends, the Hayeks, are going through a particular season of challenge for us to love them, but I know that that's not exclusive to them, right? If I say, let's see a show of hands of how many in this room are going through a season of trial or difficulty, there would probably be a lot of hands in the air. And so this, I hope, will be of some comfort and encouragement to us as we look to the future. I'm going to give you a couple warnings going in. First is that I have an obscene number of slides, <laughs> and so we're going to be moving fast. Yes, I have charts. We have graphs. <laughs> it's going to be great. <laughs> and it's going to be impossible for you to keep up if you're trying to write everything down, but the video is pauseable. So you can watch it later and pause if there was something that you wanted to catch that you didn't have time to write down. So that's my first disclaimer. The second is, why am I going through all these details instead of just generalizing it? I want to encourage us this morning with the fact that Scripture is loaded with detail about the future and that we are meant to be informed of that detail. It is good for us to have a full, clear, and sharp image in our mind of what God has in store for those who love him. And so I want to expose us to that, perhaps even if nothing else, just to whet your appetite to learn more. Another little disclaimer is many of you are aware that there are a number of different views about how the end times plays out, and it's not my purpose this morning to run down all those rabbit trails and defend one view over the other. My goal this morning is to present our understanding as a church of the end times. I don't mean that to denigrate those who have other views. I respect many of them. But this is what we believe in our understanding of Scripture. And the purpose of studying it is not to debate charts, but it's to have our souls encouraged. And I think that'll be best served by just going through the way that we understand Scripture to work. If you have specific questions... Later, you want to debate pre-millennialism versus preterism versus amillennialism versus kingdom of theology. If you want to get into all that kind of stuff, that'd be awesome. Let's do lunch. But this morning, we're going to just try to run through uh, what our church understands. And lastly, this could all be happening very soon. I don't know if you guys, when you drove in this morning, noticed there's a sign. Right? I think it might be it's a new sign for our church, or it might be a new sign for the end times. But there's a new sign. So there you go. Be, let, the, let the hearer beware. All right. <laughs> With that then, here we go. Uh, our church website has the following under its doctrinal section for Christ will return. It says this, Christ will return to this earth physically and personally to reign over his kingdom, to judge and raise, excuse me, to raise and judge the dead and establish a new heaven and a new earth. The redeemed will dwell with God forever, but judgment and eternal separation from God await all who die outside of redemption through Jesus Christ. That's our understanding in a nutshell of what the future holds for us, but let's start to break this down. And as we do so, I want to begin by looking, there's three major contexts that we see the passages about the future show up in the New Testament primarily. And you'll notice that none of them are for fighting with other Christians about which view of eschatology is better. But I also want you to notice that they're all practical. They're all meant to be for soul care. The three contexts in which you see a study of the future show up in the New Testament is in the first case, combating pride. Paul in Romans 11 says, I don't want you to be wise in your own thinking and thinking you understand what's coming next. I'm going to tell you what the future holds to keep you humble, <clears throat> to comfort the sorrowing and the persecuted. Peter in 1 Peter says, I know a lot of you guys are suffering 
as the, as the uh, persecution under Nero begins to take shape. Or in 1 Thessalonians, some of you have lost loved ones and you're wondering, what does that mean? Well, how does the Christian understand death? <coughs> Excuse me. And in both contexts, he says, let's talk about eschatology. And as also in 2 Peter, a call to holiness. This is how the world is going to end. This is what it's going to look like. Therefore, how, how should we live today in a life of holiness? And so as we go through this, I want us to begin to think, how often do I use eschatology for my soul and for others to combat pride, to comfort the sorrowing and persecuted, and to call myself and others to a holy life now in view of the future? And so we'll begin by looking at the major ages of the earth and where that's leading to. And we're going to begin with the church age. And the church age is the one in which we currently inhabit. Here's our first uh, chart, by the way. Oh, good, it's working. So we are now living in between the age where Christ has come, and we are not yet at the point where we're going to encounter this event called the Great Tribulation. So everything here in the middle is the church age. And that was inaugurated after the first coming of Jesus. And it is a period of time in which the gospel is spreading out to the Gentiles. There's a few things that are unique about it. In the Old Testament time, uh, we had a unique situation in that when you believed in God and you died, our understanding is you didn't actually get to go straight to heaven. You went to a place called paradise or Abraham's bosom. Jesus speaks of it in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. But Christ had not actually purchased our entrance into heaven yet. And so there was this waiting place. And then when Christ came, he died, he descended, and then as Acts tells us, he rose to heaven as the firstborn among the resurrection, as the first to ascend to heaven, and took with him a host. And so he let all those Old Testament saints that had been waiting for this day into heaven with him. And in this new church age, now all who die in Christ, we don't go to a waiting place, but as Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We have the blessing of being able to go straight to heaven. And so all the dead in Christ are now able to go immediately to the presence of God during this church age. <clears throat> we read about the church age throughout Scripture on the New Testament. The key word, if you want to kind of understand what is the Bible summary of this church age from an eschatology standpoint, is mystery, meaning something that we know now that they didn't know before. You can read about this in Romans chapter 16, where he talks about, whoops, excuse me, if I can do this without tapping, the mystery, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, the mystery of Christ. Mystery is the theme that drives this church age, because in the Old Testament, the prophets <clears throat> were given a glimpse of many of the events that would be in the future. They saw the first coming of Christ in clear pictures like Isaiah 53. <clears throat> Forgive me. They also saw the coming of Antichrist. They saw the setting up of the kingdom of God. All those things were mentioned. And in particular, in the book of Daniel, we see the weeks laid out there in a prophecy where Daniel was told there's going to be seven weeks and then 62 weeks of years and then there's going to be a 70th year in which the king will take over his kingdom. And you can watch in the Old Testament that those 69 weeks play out beautifully. Thank you, brother. If I totally blow a vocal cord, I'll just tap through the slides and uh, you can just read. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, we can see in history those 69 weeks play out exactly as prophesied, and then there's a gap. The things that are described in the 70th week don't happen right away. What does happen right away? This thing called the church age. And so in the Old Testament, God said there's going to be 69 weeks, and then there's going to be a 70th week. And they thought, okay, those are all going to run together. And God's like, yeah, well, you know, there's a surprise. In between 69 and 70 is this thing called the church, where the gospel is going to go out to all the Gentile nations in a powerful way. And that's where we're living right now. Christ himself points to this reality. He was called uh, to speak at a synagogue early in his ministry, and he sat down and he read from the scroll, which just happened to be open to this passage, 
Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And right there is where Jesus sat down. You'll notice there's no comma, there's no period. He stopped in the middle of a sentence. The rest of the sentence is, and the day of vengeance of our God. Why did he quit in the middle of the sentence? Because Jesus hadn't come to do that yet. That's where the church age goes. And so Jesus said, this has been fulfilled today in your hearing, everything I just read. The second half of the sentence, you're going to have to wait until after the church age to be fulfilled. So I find that fascinating. Even in the, in the ministry of Christ, you can see he understood how the ages break down. It wasn't a mystery to him. The rapture is the event that we are waiting for that will mark the end of this age and the resuming of the better known part of God's plan for the end of time. And that's what we're looking forward to right now. Again, if you're looking at the big picture of the future, and if you're curious how this chart is laid out, by the way, vertically, you've got the major ages, etc. Horizontally, I put where things happen. So the gold band, the yellow band, is and everything that happens in heaven. Green is everything that happens on earth. Red is everything that happens in hell or Sheol. And then down at the bottom is the abyss. So if you're trying to figure out what that's all about, that's how it's laid out. But we're looking now at this event right here that's going to happen at the end of the church age, the rapture of the church. And the rapture, the key word there is imminent. Imminent. It meaning it could happen at any time. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about it being in the twinkling of an eye, in a moment, when you don't expect it. There's some other cross-references on there you can look at as well. But the idea being... Nothing has to happen before the rapture. We may not finish this, this sermon. There isn't a big list of signs that we have to look for in the heavens or in politics. At any instant, Christ could come back and initiate the events of the rapture and the events of the end times that will follow. And this, this gives us an urgency and a sense of expectation as a church. It's not like, well, he's not talking about Jesus coming back because, you know, this hasn't happened and this hasn't happened and this hasn't happened. We need to be watching and waiting because at any moment we could be called with that trumpet and rise. We don't know how long we have left. That is the event that will kick off the ticking clock of the tribulation. And if you want to know how it's going to play out, you can read all about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But the key features are that the Lord is going to descend from heaven. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. And then all of us that are left are going to be caught up together with him in the clouds. What's key to note here is Jesus doesn't actually touch down anywhere on terra firma. During the rapture, he comes down in the clouds and we go up to meet him there. That's one of the distinctions between this and the second coming where Jesus is definitely going to touch down. And you'll know because where he hits, he'll split the Mount of Olives in half. But this first coming where Jesus takes us to be with him will be taking place in the clouds. And that will then lead into a period of God's judgment being poured out on the earth called the tribulation. The tribulation. And so we've been looking here at the church age, but now we're going to move into this little multicolored band. It's not supposed to be like a rainbow. It's supposed to be like a heat map, right? From cooler to hotter. That's kind of the idea. But we're going to zoom in on that period of time. And the key word here is devastation, devastation. As Joel 1.15 says, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near and it will come as destruction from the Almighty. You can read that Zephaniah 1 passage really quickly if you want to just summarize it really, really fast. It's all bad stuff. Lots of bad stuff. The tribulation is going to be a time where the world is ground into insignificance. And so let's zoom in now on that period of tribulation and take a look at what happens in this short seven-year period of time. And so we're going to be looking at this cycle of judgments that God is going to pour out. And there's going to be three primary judgment cycles, the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bowl judgments. And we'll look at those briefly, starting with the seven seal judgments. 
The first seal judgment we encounter in Scripture is the Antichrist coming to power peacefully. Uh, this is also the white horse. If you want to know what the four horsemen of the apocalypse are, here they are. Here's the first one, the white horse. We're going to see Jesus later on a white horse. This one isn't Jesus. This one is the Antichrist who is going to be able to affect global dominion without bloodshed. He's actually going to be able to go out and bring the nations under his control without having to fight an all-out war. And so oddly enough, the first judgment of God is utopia, a peaceful one-world government. How about that? Scary, huh? The second seal, which will follow after this one, and I should mention, what are these seals? You have this beautiful scene in heaven where a scroll is brought out that is the title deed to earth but it's sealed up with seven seals, which is something you used to do with a really secure document back before you could encrypt it. You would roll it up a little bit, seal, roll it up a little bit more, seal, roll it up a little bit more, seal, roll it up a little bit more, seal. And they're standing in heaven and they're saying, who can open this title deed to earth? And everyone's like, nobody, nobody. Wait, look, here he comes. A lamb as if slain. He is worthy. And so the seal judgments take place as Christ is popping the seals off of his title deed to earth. So that's kind of a cool scene. And that second seal is actually global war. The temporary peace that the Antichrist achieves is going to lead very quickly into the red horse of the apocalypse, war, open global war as the Antichrist is no longer able to talk his way into getting everybody to do what he says, and he now crushes all the opposition to him. The third seal, famine and economic collapse. This is the black horse of the apocalypse. And you're going to see famine collapsing the food markets of the world, but you're also seeing in there a quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius. Do not damage the oil. Don't damage the wine. The economic system is going to go into turmoil as things that are necessary for survival skyrocket in value. And that's going to throw all the markets of the world out the window. And one of the things you're going to watch as we go through here, imagine what it would be like for our modern world to start going through these things. How fragile is our actual power grid, or our financial markets, is our system of commerce and trade. And imagine as those things all begin to crumble and we revert back towards the Stone Ages. Four seal lands, pestilence and death. This is the ashen horse or a, perhaps a better way to translate, translate that would be a pale green, like a pale sickly green horse. And this is where there's going to be permission given uh, to death, to Hades, to go out and to kill with the sword and with famine, with pestilence and by wild beasts. All of the broken and fallen parts of the created world, disease, sickness, famine, wild animals, will turn with a vengeance upon the enemies of God. The fifth seal is broken, and this seal is the martyrs, the martyrs. Uh, we see them crying out, uh, how long, O Lord, as they, they stand around the throne of God, how long, O Lord, are you going to avenge our deaths? Uh, this is also an interesting one to see as being a judgment of God. It's actually a judgment that they are allowed to kill God's people, which, which is an upgrade for the martyrs, right? They get to go straight to heaven. But they've now messed with God's people. And that's bad news if you mess with God's children. And so one of the judgments is that they are actually successful in going after some of God's children and sending some of them to heaven. Sixth seal comes along, cosmic disasters. I'd have to circle a lot of words here uh, if we try to highlight all of those because the sky, the heavens, the, the mountains, the islands, the rocks, everything starts to go all topsy-turvy. The world loses all of its stability and predictability. And how quickly will mankind realize that even our best technologies are impotent against the power that just resides in the natural world, let alone when God allows that to turn against us. You might have a smart home with Alexa. That's not going to help you if there's a meteor shower on your smart home. And people are going to then, at the end of this, it says, they're going to run to the mountains and the rocks, and they're going to say, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to stand? One of the things I want you to notice throughout this whole book is they know the entire time where this is coming from. 
and they'll refuse to repent the entire time. It's not like, why is this happening to us? They know exactly what's going on, but their hearts are hard. That will lead to a pause then between the sixth and the seventh seal judgment. The devastation is temporarily halted. 144,000 Jews are sealed, 12,000 from each tribe, that will go out and begin to re-evangelize the world. And there is a silence in heaven for a period of half an hour. This is what you call an ominous silence. After those first six seals that have been shaking and rattling the cosmos, all of a sudden, dead quiet for a half an hour. And then the trumpet judgments begin. One of the things that you'll notice in the judgments is that the seventh judgment in the cycle contains all of the judgments that follow. So it's an exponentially increasing amount of judgment that's falling upon the earth. And so in that seventh seal judgment are all the trumpet and the bowl judgments compressed. And those now begin to be sounded. The first trumpet, one-third of all of the grass and vegetation on the earth is burned and destroyed. The second trumpet sounds, one-third of all the sea creatures and the ships. It particularly mentions the ships are destroyed. We sometimes forget you can't email all the stuff in Walmart from China. right? That comes over on ships. Our whole global economy is based off of maritime trade. And that's going to begin to be destroyed. The third trumpet, this is where wormwood happens, this giant meteor from, from space that falls and causes a third of all the rivers and springs to be defiled. Now we're also starting to affect fresh water. Right? The, just imagine the global desperation that's beginning to set in. A third of everything on the land is gone. A third of everything on the sea is gone. Now a third of even our fresh water, so vital daily for survival, is compromised. Fourth trumpet sounds. A third of the sun, moon, and stars are darkened. And <clears throat> it plays out so that for like a third of the night and for a third of the day, it's just dark. That's weird. And it's more than just weird. That's also going to really mess with everybody's biorhythms. You're not resting well when light, dark, light, dark, all of a sudden begins this weird cycle and it's getting inside people's heads. Fifth trumpet sounds, and now you begin to see more supernatural things coming about. The abyss is opened, an angel's given a key to unlock the abyss, this place where demons so bad they're not allowed to roam around earth have been stored. You can read about some of them in Genesis 6, some of them in Jude. The abyss is opened, and it belches forth this massive black cloud of demonic beings ready to torment all those on earth except for those who are Christ's. And so this all counts as the first woe. So it hasn't really gotten bad yet. <laughs> the sixth trumpet sounds and God allows an angel to release four other angels to go out and kill one out of every three human beings alive. Can you imagine that? There will not be a person on this planet who does not have an immediate friend or family member slain in this event. 33% of the world's population drops dead. How are they going to respond in the face of unstoppable judgment at this scale? They will not repent. It is not in the heart of man to do so apart from the grace of God. And even directly in the face of the judgment of God, they will not repent. This leads to a second pause. The Gentiles are going to occupy Jerusalem. There had been a treaty made with Israel by the Antichrist at the beginning of the tribulation. That is broken. The Antichrist now is going to begin a full-scale persecution of the Jews. The Jews are going to be whisked to safety in the wilderness for a period of 1,260 days, which on a Jewish calendar is exactly three and a half years, which will be the duration of the second half of this seven-year tribulation. And <clears throat> this is also where the ministry of the two witnesses is described. Two witnesses that will be preaching the gospel for 1,260 days, and then they will be martyred and left where they drop in the streets, just left to rot in the streets for three and a half days. And then they'll be resurrected right in the face of everybody. And God from heaven, it says, will say, come up here. And they go 
straight up to heaven. Uh, it's unclear which half of the tribulation exactly they're going to be in the first half or the second half, but their ministry is described during this second pause. And then there will be a massive earthquake that destroys a tenth of the city of Jerusalem and kills 7,000 people there. May angel messengers are going to be dispersed during this pause. They're going to be circling the globe, pleading for repentance, proclaiming judgment, and promising condemnation. But I want you to notice... Whoops. Um, let's see if I can... Uh, Bring this back. Getting too clever for myself. Excellent. This is grace. A plea for repentance. There we go. This is grace. Even in the face of God's judgment, he's dispatching his messengers globally to say, there's still time. There's still time to repent. That will lead us then to the seven bold judgments that unfold. And again, as you recall, these are nested. So in the seventh trumpet judgment are the seven bold judgments, and those begin to, to rain down upon the earth as well. The first bowl is malignant sores. Uh, just like Job, he lost all of his family and all of his property, and he was in mourning but he was being faithful to God, and Satan goes back to God, and God's like, well, did you see how Job handled all of that? And Satan's like, yeah, 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 yeah. But if you afflict him in his person, then he'll curse you. There's something about when the, the suffering of starts to enter into our own body, and it becomes inescapable. You cannot retreat from anywhere. And some of you who have suffered from lifelong physical maladies, where you have chronic pain, you just can't get away from it. This bowl opens up, and now everybody on earth, those who do not know Christ, are suffering from these open malignant sores all over their bodies. The second bowl now turns the entire sea to blood and kills off all the sea creatures. One of the last hopes for a reliable food supply in view of everything that's been going, out, going on on the land is now gone. Can you just imagine the stench of all the oceans turning to blood and everything in them dying simultaneously and rotting, washing up on the shores. Then the third bowl pours and the fresh water turns into blood. Panic is now setting in. Fourth bowl, scorching heat from the sun. It may be as a result of all the cosmic activity that's going on that there's a breakdown in our atmosphere, but the UV index goes through the roof. And you know what goes really well with a malignant sore? the worst sunburn you've ever had in your entire life. Can you imagine the intensity of suffering these people are going through? And the fifth bowl then plunges them all into darkness, complete and total darkness. And notice, they did not repent. They cannot repent on their own. Sixth bowl, the river Euphrates dries up. Uh, this is known as a trap. God dries up the river Euphrates, and the enemies of God say, all right, here's our opportunity. We can finally get our armies and go march against Jerusalem, and we don't have to worry about wading across this big old river. Excellent. We're going to all gather in this valley that's perfectly situated to annihilate the people of God once and for all. That little valley is called Har Megadon, which you may have heard referred to as Armageddon. The sixth bowl looks like a great thing for the enemies of God. It's a trap. And that leads to the seventh bowl, which is the final destruction of God's enemies. They are going to gather in that valley, and God is going to annihilate them with 100-pound hailstones. <coughs> and it is going to be an incredible amount of devastation. Uh, in fact, Zechariah 14 says, in addition to the giant hailstones, God is going to afflict them with a wasting disease that sounds like radiation poisoning. It says their eyes will melt in their sockets, their tongues will melt in their mouths, and their skin will begin to melt off their bodies, and in a panic, they will turn and start slaying each other as they're getting slaughtered by 100-pound hailstones. God is not messing around anymore. That is the tribulation period. 
That is the seven years where God annihilates the system of this world and batters into submission his enemies to prepare for that great moment when Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, will return to claim what is his. And that brings us then to the second coming of Jesus. Key word here, no surprise, victory. Who's coming back? Jesus, angels, and you, and me, those of us that have ever died in Christ, all return with him on this glorious, triumphal entry. This also marks the end of grace and hope, as MacArthur comments in the second coming. When Christ appears, the opportunity for salvation will be gone forever. The day of mercy already spent, Christ will summarily cut off the wicked without remedy. Revelation 19 describes this. This is the white horse that Jesus rides. The battle charger, he's called faithful and true. He rides out in righteousness to judge and wage war. Eyes are a flame of fire. On his head are many diadems. He has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. That name, of course, is the one which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, and his armies with him, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And they will go out <coughs> and watch as from the mouth of Christ a sharp sword comes out that will strike down the nations, and then he will begin to rule with a rod of iron. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Any questions? Right? He is not coming, little Jesus, meek and mild. That already happened. This is now to say, I opened all those seals. This is my planet now. I'm taking it back. Thank you very much. Uh, and so in preparation for this, an angel is going to just, I like this casually, just, he just stands in the sun. Like... So this is a good vantage point to talk to all of the birds of the planet and say, hey, dinner time. So an angel's going to stand in, in the sun. He's going to call out to all the birds of the earth and say, um, you all should get together now because there's going to be lots of food. Christ is going to annihilate all men who are in opposition to him and then have at it. <coughs> Uh, the enemies of Christ are, just, are defeated. The beast is seized. The false prophet is seized. Interestingly enough, they are thrown straight into the lake of fire. They will be in the lake of fire for a thousand years longer than anybody else. And then the rest are killed with the sword, and they will go to hell uh, and await their final judgment before God. <coughs> this is where Christ is going to be reestablishing his kingdom. You'll notice there's a little thing in the way right now. Uh, that will be dealt with. In Christ's timing, uh, this is the side of the temple where Christ will approach. And there are two things that are interesting about this place. Let me zoom in a little closer. First of all, this is a cemetery and a garbage dump that the, the Arabs have put there because they have read that Jesus is going to come back to Jerusalem from this side. And they said, but Jews are defiled if they go through garbage or if they go through a cemetery. Ha! Oh, and here's the gate that he's supposed to go in, so we will... Put stones in it. That'll fix it. That'll keep them out. At least they've read their eschatology, right? At least they, they probably still know more about it than we do. Unfortunately, that's not going to be sufficient. This is a view the other direction looking out at the Mount of Olives, and it looks like a sandy shore out there, but those are all tombstones as Jews pay enormous amounts of money to be buried on the Mount of Olives because they know that's where Messiah will come back. And they want to be the first to be there when he appears, and the tragedy is so many of those tombstones represent people who have rejected the Messiah and will not be rising from the dead when he returns to that exact spot. This will lead us to a transition period. The tribulation now is complete. Christ has come back, but there is going to be this period of transition as the kingdom is set up and inaugurated. I just wanted to mention this briefly because uh, it's something that's often uh, skipped over. Uh, but there is going to be an actual a little gap in between the tribulation and when the kingdom itself is inaugurated. <clears throat> a transition period you can read about in Daniel chapter 12, where it says there is going to be 1,290 days since the setting up of the abomination of desolation and this period that you want to attain to. And then how blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days. What's all that about? Well, let's just do some math. We know from the middle of the tribulation to the end of the tribulation is 1,260 days. Revelation tells us that over and over. 
So what's this 1,290 and then 1,335 days? Well, you do some math and you realize there's going to be a 75-day period total made up of a 30-day chunk and then the, re the remainder up to 75-day chunk during which Christ is establishing and setting up his millennial kingdom before it's officially inaugurated. So that's your millennial kingdom uh, uh, transition period, which finally brings us to the kingdom, right? This is the good part, uh, where we get to reign with Christ again. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord, <coughs> and that takes place right here uh, following the tribulation for a thousand years. Key word is peace. Christ is physically on this planet. He's physically ruling from Jerusalem. Satan, it says, will be bound, and he will not be allowed to deceive the nations or to do any work during this period of time. <coughs> the saints, us, will be reigning with Christ. Uh, there we go. <coughs> but I want to talk just a moment about how we're going to spend our time during the very beginning. You'll notice I have this little seven-month and seven-year deal. What's that all about? Just to appreciate that this is actually a physical thing that's going to happen, and you have to deal with some of the physical realities of having actually wiped out almost the entire population of the planet. Ezekiel 39 says that for seven years, you're going to be burning all the weapons of war, just scraping them into piles and burning them, the wreckage of all of the armies of mankind. And perhaps even more sobering, a couple of verses later, for seven months, you're just going to be trying to bury the dead. For seven months, the number one task of millennial kingdom citizens is gathering up dead bodies and burying them. What a powerful testimony that will be to the absolute lordship of Jesus Christ. And so that's why you have seven months of burying, seven years of burning. What's it going to be like in the millennial kingdom? The land will be restored to Israel. Right now, Israel has a little patch about like that, which is not what God promised them. That will be fully restored to Israel. The enemies of God will be defeated. The prosperity will be enjoyed as the effects of the curse are minimized. Jerusalem will be established again as the center of the earth. The temple priesthood will also be reinstated. Israel will rise to prominence in the world. The Gentiles throughout the earth will be blessed. Knowledge of God will be universal. Nature will be perfected. This is when that whole like sending your little boy to play in the pit viper's den thing will happen. Right now that's a bad idea. In the millennial kingdom that'll be just a good idea to do for an afternoon. Sorrow is eliminated and King Jesus will reign. These are millennial ra realities so why is the next slide final rebellion? What's up with that? The sad reality is after a thousand years of Jesus reigning on earth, there's going to be another rebellion against him. The key word here is unsuccessful. Happens at the end of the millennium. It coincides. Satan will be released after 1,000 years of bondage. It says he'll immediately go back to tempt the nations. And incited by Satan's deceptions, they will rise against God again. Uh, you can read about that in Revelation chapter 20. The key word, though, or key uh, phrase here is that they came up and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. God's not entertaining rebellion. This is rod of iron time. They gather, we're here to make war with gone. The last great rebellion of mankind. Where did those rebels come from? There's two different groups of people that come into the millennial kingdom. One group are those that come down with Jesus at his second coming, all who died in Christ during the tribulation or before. The second group that enter the millennial kingdom are those that survive the tribulation. Those saints which survive the tribulation, they're still mortal. They're still marrying. They're still having children. Not all of those children will be saved. What's the lesson there? In the face of God's immediate, overwhelming persecution, the heart of man cannot and will not repent apart from the act of grace, the grace of God working directly on them. In the face of God's direct blessing and rulership, the hearts of man cannot and will not repent without the grace of God directly intervening. That leads to the white throne judgment then, which takes place here at the end of the millennial kingdom, immediately following this last great rebellion. Key word here is condemnation. Everybody, the dead of every age, will be present. 
absent, this is a really big deal, is believers. You will never appear at a great white throne. That's not for you. You're already enjoying hanging out with Christ in the millennial kingdom. But this is where those who are still dead outside of Christ are brought back from the grave and they all are forced to appear before God and he will have the Lamb's book of life and he will go through, your name's not in here, your name's not in here, your name's not in here, and they will be then referred to the books, which is a record of every deed everybody has ever done. Since you're not covered by Christ, you're now going to stand before a perfect God on your own merits. And that's going to be devastating for every single human being who is there, and it is going to be undeniable because the record is clear. And then death and Hades and all those who are part of that great white judgment throne will be poured into the lake of fire, and it mentions again where the beast and the false prophet have been for the last thousand years. This is when God will establish the eternal state where we will live forever in a new heavens and a new earth. The key word there is perfection. This is where you'll spend forever, not in heaven, not in a cloud, not airy-fairy, no harps. It's explicitly mentioned. You'll be on a new earth beneath a new heaven, a glorious place. Isaiah talks about this. Peter talks about this. Revelation talks about this. Some key features, no sea, no ocean. 75% of our planet is a reminder that God soaked the last group of rebels. That's not going to be true anymore. Rivers, yes. Springs, yes. Oceans, no. Beautiful new Jerusalem will come down from heaven. God will dwell with men as he did back in the garden. No more pain, no more death, no more suffering. And we all get to live in a city that's really big. That's to scale. This is the length of one wall. Uh, my dad and I calculated once if you put 100-foot ceilings in this city and you populated the city with the population density of America, which is a pretty comfortable country, you could fit all the people that scientists estimate have ever lived on the planet in this city. Massive, massive, amazing city. <coughs> That's your future, oh church. This is what Christ has in store for those who know him and love him. Can you picture it? few thoughts to leave with. What an amazing hope we have. What an amazing hope we have. And mankind is completely without excuse. If somebody says, well, if God would just anything, no, you wouldn't. You need to repent based off of the testimony of Jesus Christ and his word. That is sufficient. There's no amount of blessing or persecution and condemnation God could pour out on you that would fix the hardness of your heart. There must be urgency in evangelism because this could all start at a moment's notice. And how many of you would like your neighbor to go through the tribulation on the wrong side of God's wrath? This is reality. This world is not our focus. Amen. How privileged are we that we get to live for another reality? And then lastly, the one I want to hammer is, use this doctrine. Use it. Use it for humility when you see pride in your own heart, in your own wisdom. Let the view of what God is going to do shrink your view of yourself. Use this for comfort. When life hurts, run to the reality that God's going to fix it. He will smash evil and annihilate and erase it from his cosmos. He will reconcile all things to Jesus Christ and use it for exhortation. How can I be allowing this sin to master my life when I have been called to be a child of the king and to reign with him for a thousand years over this planet and then submit in his kingdom for eternity after that in the new heavens and the new earth with such glory coming down the pike? Why am I so fond of this sin? Use this doctrine. Let it be so clear that when you close your eyes, you can picture glory. And if we will do that, this doctrine has the, the power and the ability to, think, I think, be one of the most encouraging and transformative truths in all of Scripture. And so I close with this. And in view of time, I think we'll just skip our closing song and we'll make this our, our close. He who testifies to these things says, this is Jesus, I am coming quickly. And all God's people said, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. You are dismissed.